is my privilege to welcome all of you tonight to this second Ford MIT Nobel Laureate Lecture. The Institute is tremendously grateful to the Ford Motor Company for their sponsorship of this lecture series. We started this year and will continue next year, we hope, with three or possibly four such lectures. Uh, Ford is represented tonight by Dr. Christopher McGee, who's in the second row here in the center section, Chris. Uh, Chris is a visiting engineer at MIT. He has served this year as a member of the organizing committee for this lecture series, and we're pleased to have him present here tonight with his wife, Joanne. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Charles H. Towns, received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1964 for, and I quote, fundamental work in the field of quantum electronics, which has led to the construction of oscillators and amplifiers based on the Maser laser principle, end quote. Dr. Towns holds the original patent for the Maser for those of you who uh, may not be familiar with the term, my memory is that it stands for molecular amplification through the stimulation of emitted radiation. And he holds jointly with his brother-in-law, Arthur Schallau, the original laser patent, light amplification through the stimulation of emitted radiation. This work was done largely at Columbia University. I don't have to tell anyone here about the enormous impact which coherent light and the laser have had on the world. There is hardly anything one can touch without coming in contact with the fruits of those inventions. If you consider the utility of lasers, collimated light, coherent light in instrumentation, scientific and technical instrumentation, consider it in medicine, where it is used in all kinds of diagnostic ways. It's used for surgery. In optical communications, we will soon be in an age in which, in which uh, all communications is transmitted, well, on the earth at least, by optical methods rather than by copper wires. And in all manner of daily conveniences, such as the CD player or the CD-ROM player in your computer, all depend on the laser. Dr. Towns is no stranger to MIT. He served as provost of the institute in the administration of Julius Adam Stratton from 1961 to 1965. And that's when I first met him as an assistant professor in electrical engineering. Uh, Dr. Towns has also served on the faculty of the University of California in the distinguished position of university professor and he is now professor in the graduate school at the University of California at Cal Berkeley. Charlie explained to me before dinner that Cal has this enlightened policy in which emeriti professors, if they wish to continue to do research or to do some teaching, may continue with the title professor in the graduate school. And he explained that he is one of the pigs, right? <laughs> professor in the graduate school. Dr. Towns has frequently served as advisor to the United States government and indeed to governments elsewhere as well. He was a member and served as vice chairman of the President's Science Advisory Committee in the Johnson administration. He was chairman of the Technical Advisory Committee for the Apollo program through the time of the first lunar landing. He's been active in the work of the National Academies. He's a member of the Academies of Science and Engineering and has been active in their work with the former Soviet Union on arms control, uh, with China, and with other nations. He serves, has served as a member of the uh, uh, Papal Academy of Sciences and has provided advice in that manner to the Pope on arms control and uh, the, the search for peace. Dr. Towns has an extraordinary list of honors beyond the Nobel Prize from academies and scientific societies across the world, not just in the U.S., but across the world. Uh, after his uh, remarks this evening, he will welcome questions from the audience. 
his, his address is, as you know, is entitled The Black Hole at the Center of Our Galaxy. I should say now, and we'll remind you again at the end, that there will be a reception following this lecture in Lobby 13, which if you go through any of these doors and out in that direction, in the northern direction, is just down a set of stairs. There'll be a reception to which you're all invited following the lecture and the questions. Please join me now in welcoming our distinguished speaker, speaker Charles H. Towns. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I want to say it's a great pleasure for my wife Frances and I to be back here at MIT. We spent uh, five uh, fascinating years here back in the 60s. And it's a pleasure to be back and see some old friends and see all the great things that are happening at MIT. Um, <clears throat> yes, I will talk about the black hole in the center of our galaxy. And, um, but in doing that, I must also talk about our galaxy very generally, many aspects of it. Now, <clears throat> the work I'm going to discuss will be that of many people. I and my students have done some things on the black hole, yes, but uh, as in much of science, the growth of science and of new ideas is a contribution for many people. Uh, with many different techniques. And uh, you'll see that illustrated. First, uh, let me remind you what a galaxy is like, particularly a spiral galaxy. Let's see, I have a pointer here. These are black and white pictures of spiral galaxies. And uh, there's one we're seeing face on, you might say. This is one that's rather tilted. You see that it's almost like a pancake shape. If we tilt it more, it'd be still thinner. Uh, and materials going around. Uh, what you're seeing here is largely stars. And these galaxies have a few, million, few billion stars in them, generally. They vary in size, of course. Um, <clears throat> the center of the galaxy would be here. Now, we ourselves on Earth, about, uh, about a third to half away out from the center. So we're sort of along about in here, and we try to look into the center. We can't see it with visual light. Astronomers couldn't see into the center of our galaxy for a long time. In fact, it was only in the early part of the last century that people realized we were in a galaxy. And there it was all the time, the Milky Way. If you look at the Milky Way, that's we looking out towards all of these stars. And the Milky Way is the plane of the galaxy of this flat pancake shape, shape thing. It was there all the time, but we only realized that, hey, we are in a galaxy. Uh, and there are billions of galaxies out there. We're just, uh, we're just one of them. Now, um, the center of the galaxy wasn't visible because not only are there stars in the galaxy, but there are gas clouds. And these gas clouds have dust particles in them and so on. So if we try to look through the center of the galaxy, we only see the nearest stars. And we can't see very far because of the dust and the clouds. And optical astronomers and visible light just wouldn't get through and they didn't see them for many years. The first discovery of the center of the galaxy actually was made by an engineer. And this is typical. The accidents that occur in science, people who are curious and they investigate and they're careful Engineer Jansky at Bell Telephone Laboratories discovered microwaves coming from a particular position in the sky. And with the help of astronomers, he recognized this is where the center of our galaxy probably is. And it was a very strong microwave source. Uh, that stayed there for some years. People didn't know what to make of it. They didn't do too much about it. They didn't know what to do. And uh, only later it began to be studied more and more, and radio waves began to be more and more a very important tool uh, for astronomy. 1968, uh, Jansky's work was in the mid-30s. 1968, we had for the first time the discovery of infrared waves coming from the center of our galaxy. And uh, that, that was, um, uh, uh, 
that was done by Becklin, a student, and Neugebauer. Neugebauer was a professor, a very distinguished professor, invented a lot of infrared astronomy. And uh, the student Becklin said, well, you know, I'm going to work, be working by myself tonight. I, can I look at the center of the galaxy? And Neugebauer said, no, don't, I don't think you'll find anything there. Don't bother. But he did, anyhow. Remember that now. Don't, don't take what your professors say all the time. <laughs> Question it. He looked, and he discovered this bright infrared source. Wonderful discovery. And of course, they went on to uh, create the science from that. Well, infrared gets through the dust particles as well as radio waves. Uh, <clears throat> well, now, uh, I want to show you um, a picture of our galaxy as we see it from where we are using a number of different types of waves because that's what we use. We use all the possible techniques we can and these are some of the samples. Let me get it uh, right. Yeah, there we are. These are some of the samples. Uh, here's radio, and this is the Milky Way. Well, first let's look at the, let's, let's look at the visible light. Here's the visible light. That's the Milky Way. Now notice these dark patches in there. That's not because they're not stars. It just means they're dark clouds, shielding all the stars. Uh, and we didn't wake up to what was going on there for a long time. We finally, you recognize that there's stars there, the dark clouds, and the, the center of our galaxy is about in there. If we look at it in radio waves. It looks much brighter. It's bright all through this region. We'll see a more detailed picture uh, later. Infrared. See, this is uh, most of the infrared energy is sort of centered here. That's the center of our galaxy. X-rays. are X-rays coming from the Milky Way. Gamma rays. Look at the gamma rays. They come from special spots in the Milky Way where something very energetic is happening. So that's a kind of a sample of uh, some of our ways of looking at it. Now let me uh, show you. Um, what can be done with an array of telescopes in the radio region? With an array of telescopes on the San Augustine Plain in New Mexico, about 29 telescopes in all, spaced at various separation in this particular one case. They all, they all nod together and point to the sky. It's almost like they're dancing together. The rays come down. They're, the signals are joined from all these telescopes, and that gives very high angular resolution as well as good sensitivity. Because all of the telescopes working together, they're spread over a long distance, that gives very high angular resolution. And so radio waves have obtained angular resolution really better than optical waves so far, even though they're much longer wavelength. Uh, here is a general picture of the Milky Way, taken, taken with radio waves. Whoops. Let me see. Here it is, taken with radio waves. That's the brightest part in the center that Jansky had found. The brightness is proportional to, to the uh, intensity of the radio waves. And this is a kind of a map made with those antennas by, uh, uh, by uh, well, Kassim at, at Harvard. Is, one of the more important people that's involved in this particular map. And this is the bright center. Now you'll notice some stripes here also, and people call them threads and uh, snakes. And so there's a snake there, they call it. There's a mouse and so on. Those are just names. There's supernovae, many supernovae in this area. These are supernovae that are blown up many years ago. Uh, but the remnants are still there, and they can be seen. And this is the plane of our galaxy, or the plane of the Milky Way. Uh, now, let's look at still more detail. That's a, that's a little bit more detail. Uh, that, in particular, is uh, across here is about 1,500 light years. 1,500 light years. Now, light year, the distance light travels in a year's time, and uh, it's, a, it's about, uh, oh, 600 billion miles is a light year. And that's 1,500 of them. Uh, now, let's... Uh, Look in a little more detail still, again with those same antennas, so-called VLA, very large array. This is the bright spot in the very center. 
And now we're, we're talking about a few hundred light years across here instead of a few thousand. And look at these stripes. <coughs> look at those stripes, straight lines. What's doing that? That tells us there's a magnetic field in this direction. And radio waves are emitted by electrons spiraling around the magnetic fields. And they emit microwaves as they go. And so this uh, tells us something about the direction of the magnetic field and the strength. There are other places, many other striations in here and other stripes that you saw. That's one of the more prominent ones. There's also a very interesting collection of stars up in here at a place called a pistol, because somebody thought it looked like a pistol. Um, we, we have to find names for these things. Now, I want to uh, give you still more detail. Again, with radio telescopes, we're going to look at this region about this much, this, this, this much size, magnified still more. And the first slide will show us that, I hope. You can have the first slide. Uh, now, these are pictures of various intensities. First, here is that sort of central brightest place. This is the red represents the brightest part of all. The blue is less bright. And you see here is a kind of an ellipse, an el almost an ellipse here, uh, as well as a stripe across there. And um, now up here, we have a little less amplification. And uh, there's a bright spot there. This is another picture of it, a bright spot. But it's elongated along this direction, along this direction. But now if we go very weak, look at this very, very bright spot still. And this part is cut in blue. We would call it very dim. And this part is a very bright spot there. That, that bright spot was first found by Malik and Brown in 1974, University of Washington. They did it with different antennas from what I showed you. These antennas have mapped it out nicely. And that bright spot, very intense in microwave energy. And they couldn't resolve it. They knew it was, seemed to be a spot so far as they could tell. Uh, and they named it Sagittarius A star. Sagittarius A star. They didn't know what it was, but there was a suggestion maybe it's a black hole and things are falling into it, and that will produce a lot of energy. But there are various other possibilities it could have been, and uh, nobody knew how big it was or just, just what it was, but clearly it was a bright spot, and there it is. You see, as we resolve it more and more, this, this is much radio radiation produced by electrons, high energy electrons going around doing things here. But there's something very peculiar there that is indeed uh, bright and small. Now, that spot by now has been resolved with radio telescopes. And uh, <coughs> this was, uh, this was uh, uh, done by a group of people, Backer and Lowe at, uh, at uh, Berkeley and some others. Uh, it was a kind of a national cooperative effort. There were antennas on the east coast, antennas on the west coast. The two antennas, east and west then, the long distance between them was equivalent to a telescope that big, so far as the resolution was concerned. They did what's known as interferometry. And they found the size of that. They measured it three millimeters using short microwaves, three millimeters and a baseline of 2,000 miles. A separation between telescopes of 2,000 miles, basically a telescope that big. And they found it was one-sixth of a thousandth of an arc second in size. One-sixth of a thousandth of an arc second in size. Now, that's equivalent to looking at an atom at this distance. If we could see an atom, we would be getting the kind of resolution that the radio has gotten in that object. But they finally resolved it, uh, and for the first time, found out how big it, how, how big it was. Uh, that's the highest resolution anyone's gotten yet, although Bernie Burke was here, uh, has achieved something very close to that with the radio astronomy on, on some other objects. Um, now, in addition to that peculiar object, there are many very odd and bright stars in this region. And now if we take that off, um, I want to show this is in that so-called Pistol Nebula. And there's a bright star. That's the brightest star we've ever found. 
It puts out light which is 10 million times as bright as the sun. It's believed to be about 100 times heavier than the sun. And it's out there where those stripes were. Near the galactic center, but not at the very center. The brightest star we know. Now you'll see as we go along, the galactic center is a wonderful laboratory. The center of our galaxy produces things that we don't see, can't see anywhere else. Uh, conglomerations of matter and matter falling together and energies and things that are going on that we can't produce in the laboratory. We don't see in nearby stars anything. It's a, lab it's a laboratory out there for us where we can observe and see what's new and understand it. And if we have to, we can study it in more detail and it's the best galactic center we have simply because it's the closest. The others are at least a hundred times, the centers of other galaxies are at least a hundred times further away. This center is only about uh, 25,000 light years away. Well, that's kind of far, but it's the closest one we have. <laughs> and, uh, and furthermore, it's close enough for us to get the kind of detail that uh, uh, we're talking about here, and, I'll, and I, will, I will talk about some more. Uh, other things that were found, found coming from that region that excited people was uh, gamma rays of half a million electron volts, 0.511. Now, those of you nuclear physicists will know 0.511. Hey, that's the gamma rays that are created when an electron and a proton come together and annihilate each other. I mean, an electron and a, pro and a, <laughs> and a positron come together and annihilate each other. They produce two photons of that energy. So there's annihilation going up there, and people thought, ah, that, you know, it's probably the black hole, uh, probably a black hole, and a lot of energy around there, things falling in, that's probably what it is. Later found, no, it wasn't that. It's something about a half, an, half a degree away from the center. When they located where it was really coming from, it's not in the center, about a half a degree, close by, about a half a degree away. But it's, just, it's recombining positrons and electrons about 10 to the 12th tons per second. Matter being destroyed. And it's now called the Great Annihilator. The greatest annihilator we know, anyhow. Um, we also have 1.8 million volt gamma rays coming from this region. have been discovered. 1.8 million electron volt gamma rays coming from this region. What's that characteristic of? Well, the nuclear physicists know what it's characteristic of. It's aluminum 26, which decays, and as it decays, it produces another atom, and that decays and produces gamma ray. It has a lifetime of about a million years, and so something big, explosive, has happened there within the last million years or so. Supernovae can do that, but this would have to correspond to a lot of supernovae. The intensity is so great, and it's spread around the center. Spread around the center, it's in a kind of a volume area. So there's a lot, hap lot that's happened there within the last million years. Some very explosive things. If supernovae, then there were lots of them, and more than we can generally count or expect at the moment. Well, now, let me, um, let me try to give you... Um, Got an overall picture here. What we see. So to quickly get an overall picture, here is a Milky Way which is what we see, excepting with a telescope, you see vastly more stars. As I mentioned, our galaxy, our galaxy actually has about 10 billion stars. And so if you look up there with a telescope, you see all, all of these little bright spots of stars. Now we, this is the center. And you see, well, we might guess that's a concentrated region, might be the center, but what is it? We're not really seeing we, into the center. We're seeing just some of the nearer parts of, nearer parts of our galaxy here. Now if you look into the center, uh, with radio waves, you get this. First place, you see microwaves coming from this region, which is outlined with lines as a sort of a uh, area here. Here is this oval, which I showed you earlier, an oval there and a stripe going across it. 
But in addition to that, there is molecular gas. And this colored matter is molecular gas. We know that, again, from radio waves, microwaves, which detect the radiation from HCN, the rotation of the molecule HCN. So this is a neutral cloud, an unionized cloud of molecules here. We can tell the temperature. The temperature is the order of the anywhere from uh, 100 degrees down to about 20 degrees. It cools off. We get out here. As it cools off, it's so cold that HCN won't even rotate, and we don't see the HCN anymore. It's probably still out here, but it's not radiating. Here it radiates, and then as we go in still closer, we get ionized material, which is uh, what you see here in the original radio picture. That's ionized material. This is done with radio spectroscopy, microwave spectroscopy, and there's a cloud of molecules. So we go in from very cold material. It gets warmer. There's molecular material, and gets ionized. And then in, in here, there's practically nothing in some places. And there's Sagittarius A star, that point right there, Sagittarius A star. Um, OK, now we take a very, very magnified picture just in this region of Sagittarius A star. It's right there. But we don't see anything much there. This is in, this is with infrared with a big telescope. Uh, and uh, this is two tenths of a parsec. Now, one parsec is about three light years. So this is really about one light year across. This is one, one light year across. This is about eight light years across here. This uh, circle here is a, about eight, years in eight light years in diameter. We're talking about one light year roughly here. And there's the Sagittarius A star. These are stars. They're various intensities. We don't see much infrared coming from that region. And yet, it has very intense uh, radio waves. Uh, let me um, just show you another picture with the Keck telescopes. This is taken by UCLA scientists, University of California, Los Angeles, with the Keck telescopes. And uh, again, this is Sagittarius A star, and these are stars. This is very much, very much enlarged. You say five light days is what we're seeing here. Very much enlarged, and there just uh, seems to be nothing there. Uh, now, that's surprising in that black hole, what is a black hole? A black hole represents a concentration of mass, which is so concentrated, the gravitational field is very, very large. And it's so large that nothing can get away, not even light. You shine a flashlight from a black hole, the light goes out a little ways and falls back in again. Nothing can get away from a black hole. Such a concentrated mass. Now, it may be, may not be very heavy. It could be just have a very small radius and they have a very strong uh, gravitational field. But typically, what we know of black holes, what we think we know, they're bigger objects, like at least as heavy as a star. And we'll see that this one is much heavier. Uh, and still a small enough radius that the gravitational fields are enormously large. If you fall in, you're gone. You never get out. And you're more or less indescribable from then on. It's just all, all matter is all the same in there. Um, that's a black hole. And now, we have to expect there should be some black hole somewhere. If our theoretical ideas are right, if things can become so condensed, we have to expect, yes, there'll be some black holes. The way we'd expect to find them, well, the center of our galaxy is a natural place. Everything is attract things are being attracted to the center of our galaxy. We're spinning around them slowly. If we slow down, we'll start falling in. Centrifugal force will decrease. We'll fall in. And so things fall in. Things should accumulate there. That's where matter should accumulate. And we should have a very high mass. And then uh, uh, maybe a black hole would develop. Um, here is a, a still more detailed picture that central region we showed. And uh, you just see it again, as Sagittarius A star. The so-called Western Arc, which is um, part of this ellipse, that I'll call it. And you'll see more about the ellipse here. And the, this thing is sort of at the center of this ellipse. And then there's this, this 
molecular gas around it, which then gets cold as it goes on out there. And then there's the northern arm, which is material that seems to be just coming in, coming in towards the center. Right here, the northern arm, and then the part of the ellipse that goes around like this. Um, OK, now uh, let me show you another tool which is used. In the next slide, we'll show another important tool in the study of the galactic center, uh, which is an airplane. This is an airplane that flies above most of the atmosphere. It flies around, around 40,000 feet. Why is that? That's because far infrared radiation doesn't get through our atmosphere very, uh, through very well, particularly water vapor, but other parts of the atmosphere. So we want to get above the atmosphere as much as possible. And this is the so-called Kuiper Observatory built by NASA. You get up about 40,000 feet, and then you open up this thing here. Uh, we're back in the middle of the plane, uh, closed off because the pressure is too low here for us to be in that section. It's separated off here, and the telescope is out there. The telescope can be operated, look out, and study waves that can't get through to the ground. Um, now, I want to show um, uh, next something, uh, a result obtained in that airplane by Gordon Stacy, who worked with us at Berkeley for a while, but he did this particular thing with students at Cornell. Um, he, took a, he, took, he mapped out the far or mid, and, mid or far, well, far infrared generally, we would call it. Um, in this region, and uh, this is what he found. This is the ellipse that you've been seeing, but you can see it also seems to go all the way around almost, an ellipse around there. Sagittarius A star is right in here. This is at 30, this is at 32 microns wavelength. 32 microns is, is what? Well, uh, one micron is 10 to the minus 4 centimeters, or 1,000th of a millimeter, so this is about a 30th of a millimeter wavelength. Far infrared, this is 38 microns. And you see they're a little different. They depend a little different on the, on the uh, differently on temperature. Uh, but you can see it's pretty clearly an elliptical thing here, and something bright coming down there and across here, and then the other warm things around. And this is, a, this is a heat radiation from something as warm, but it doesn't, it's not very warm in order to put out uh, these longer wavelengths. That's about three times the peak wavelength put out by the Earth at its temperature. Um, all right, now uh, we at Berkeley started studying the galactic center fairly early, not so long after it had been detected in the infrared at Caltech. And the next slide will show a couple of students and I down in Chile. Chile is the best part, best place we know on Earth to observe in telescopes because of the atmosphere is so calm and uh, and uh, uh, and non-turbulent. And uh, there is uh, uh, Tom Jabal <laughs> and uh, myself and John Lacey. Uh, Tom is now at uh, out in Hawaii, the University of Hawaii, and later the University of Texas. And we went down to Chile, partly because of the good atmosphere, but partly because the Galactic Center goes right overhead there. For us here, we have to look fairly far south to see the Galactic Center. The Galactic Center goes right overhead, and there was a nice telescope there. And uh, so we went down there to examine it. And we, we decided to examine the gas because we didn't know anything much about the center. Much of what I showed you hadn't yet been measured. And we felt if we measured the gas, the type of gas, and its velocity, maybe we could see whether, whether there's a black hole there, whether things were going around a black hole. Uh, now, what gases would we measure? Well, the radio people seeing waves knew that the gas was ionized in the central region. And so we would look for ions. We could look for ions of argon or neon or sulfur and the spectral lines. By, and work in the infrared, which would get through the dust. We worked it in 10 microns, 10 microns of mid-infrared, get through the dust, look into there, and see. And by picking those ions, we could tell 
what's the energy of excitation? Because each one had a different energy of excitation. What's the average energy of excitation? And we found neon was very plentiful. Argon was not so plentiful. Sulfur wasn't there at all. That meant that the stars producing ultraviolet there had temperatures up to about 30 or 35,000 degrees. Our sun is around 5,000 degrees, you may know. Well, these stars are bright and hot compared to the sun, but they're not the hottest type. So we get fairly hot stars, but not very hot stars in the galactic center. Now, also, this allowed one to tell the density of the gas. The density of the gas is around 10 to the fourth or 10 to the fifth particles per cubic centimeter. Now, this air we're breathing is about 10 to the 19th particles per cubic centimeter. So that's very rarefied, about the best vacuum we can get on Earth. But nevertheless, for, for interstellar space, that's a fairly high density, 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth. The material is ionized. We can see what it, what it was. Also, we could measure the velocity using a Doppler shift. Using a Doppler effect, we can measure the velocity. We found, sure enough, there's some pretty high velocities. And a further study of that showed a good eel about what might be there. Um, and uh, this was followed up by my students as they moved on to other places, which I was pleased about. They continued, and uh, John, John Lacey and Gene Sarabin. John Lacey was in Caltech and in Texas, and Sarabin was down at Caltech. Um, and uh, here is the ellipse, and these are the points that they measured. They measured the velocity of the gas at all of these points. And along these points, which we call the northern arm, this is the ellipse, this is the northern arm. Those are the points that they measured. Uh, and uh, now what did they find? Let's look along the ellipse first. And um, this is what they found. As you go from the bottom to the top, the velocity varied from bottom of the lips, minus 100 kilometers per second to plus 100 kilometers per second. Now, minus 100 kilometers per second, astronomers use minus to say it's coming towards you. Minus 100 kilometers means it's coming towards you at 100 kilometers per second. Plus 100 means going away from you. Well, that's just what you'd expect of something going around in a circular fashion. And you look at it edge on. You can work out the arithmetic. Is What's the velocity towards or away from you? It goes exactly linearly with distance up the ellipse. It goes exactly linear. That's, that's just what, almost what it was doing. These variations, however, are real. Those variations from linearity are real. So it's almost a steadily rotating circle of material, but not quite steady. Uh, now that says that you notice around Sagittarius A star, there was some gas, yes, but there was evacuated material. And then there was gas a little further out at the ellipse. That says something big happened sometime in the past. This material was blown out. How far in the past? Well, with these differences in velocities, one could say that this ring of material, different parts would bump into each other in about 50,000 years, and they would even out their velocity. All go around the same velocity. They weren't going quite the same velocity. So something big has happened within the last 50,000 years there. In addition, with the velocity, one could say, well, how much mass is inside of there? This is like the Earth circling around the sun. We know how fast it moves around the sun and how far away it is. We can say, well, what's the mass of the sun? Because the gravity is attracting it, and the centrifugal force has to equal that attraction. So the mass in there was about 4 million times the mass of the sun. Now, this is only uh, that ellipse has a radius of about four light years. And about four light years is the distance of the nearest star to us. But you have a mass of 4 million stars within that distance within that uh, ellipse of that circulating material. Sarabin uh, interpreted the so-called northern arm. And he found that was equivalent to another, uh, a very, not a circle, but an elliptical thing. And that's the position of, a, of Sagittarius A star. There's these points. And they fit very nicely in velocity and position with an ellipse. And the, the velocity, you could say, well, that, yes, that looks like it has about three or three and a half million times the mass of the sun. And he comes in fairly, fairly close, in this case, several times closer than the, than the uh, uh, ellipse was. So it has to be in fairly close 
uh, within that close, that distance, there's, there's still about four million uh, times the mass of the, uh, of the sun. Um, all right, now I want to show another kind of overall picture, a diagram, to um, remind you of some of the things that we're seeing. seeing. This side where Sagittarius A star is. This is the ellipse. Uh, this is the western arc of the ellipse. This is the, uh, just outside of that, is the molecular material. And the northern arm coming down there. We find here's a batch of atomic material, again seen from its spectra. And uh, Reinhard Gensel, who was at Berkeley now, uh, now largely uh, in Munich, uh, did much of that work. And uh, there are other things that various people found, radio astronomers especially, found that there's a star here with material kind of streaming out behind it, as if wind or something is blowing out material. Furthermore, there's a kind of a cavity here, as if something has cleared that out. The thought is, well, maybe that was over closer to Sagittarius A star, and Sagittarius A star had a big wind and blew that out, and maybe it's blowing this out. It's exactly in the direction going from Sagittarius A star to this star where these tails are blown out there. Um, now, if we go a little further, make a, make a map of a bigger area, here is the striations corresponding to the magnetic fields. There were the striations in here. Here's the great annihilator down here, annihilating positrons and electrons uh, at a great rate. Uh, so those are some of the many things that a wide number of people discovered, and I'll give you a, a, general, a general overall uh, picture. Uh, now, <clears throat> we were thought we could argue fairly strongly that there had to be a black hole there because of the very high velocities of gas, because of the patterns of motion of the gas. But <clears throat> not everybody wanted to believe that. Why? Because the black hole attracts material. Material will fall in it. We know there's a lot of gas here. We can measure the gas. There's a lot of gas there, a lot of stars putting off gas. We can measure the gas. We know there must be material falling in. If you calculate what that material falling in would do, it would fall in towards the black hole. It would circle around it, get ionized, and as it circle around, it would emit a lot of radiation. It would emit, emit too much radiation, and people calculated it emit about 1,000 times more than what was seen. So it couldn't be a black hole. It couldn't be a black hole of that much mass anyhow. That was the current theory of the, de of the day. That, that it just can't be that kind of mass. There's something, something wrong there. Because material falling in has got to get accelerated and then ionized and it'll radiate, and uh, it'll radiate far too much. Um, now, um, that argument went on for some time. We felt the evidence was pretty good, but people said, well, maybe the gas is being blown by a wind. Not, that's what gives it its high velocity, some kind of a wind. Or maybe there's a magnetic field that's accelerated the gas. After all, we know there's a magnetic field there. Well, we could measure the magnetic fields, however, from uh, Zeeman effects in the fine structure of atoms. The magnetic fields were not very big. The winds, we knew something about those. Those weren't very big. Nevertheless, everybody was looking hard for some other explanation. And now, this is a, a, not an uncommon phenomenon. Uh, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong, but you find some evidence, and yes, it might be this, it might be that, and uh, uh, you think the evidence is pretty strong, but it doesn't agree with somebody else, and so you've got to struggle over it. And this uh, debate among scientists is an important part of the process, uh, and it was debated for some time. Um, now I think it's been more or less settled, and what really convinced the remaining astronomers um, was a measurement of stellar motion because they felt, well, the gas, somehow that can be blown around and we can't rely on gas velocities too much. Stars, on the other hand, are kind of hard, firm objects and uh, you can't do too much fancy with them. Uh, and here are some stars measured by Gase and her colleagues down at UCLA using a Keck telescope. Here's 1995, a group of stars very close to Sagittarius A star. Look at them three years later. 
You see the difference in position. Look, this angle, the angle between these two has changed. The distance between these two in position has changed, and so on. Even one star which was there has disappeared, uh, changed intensity. So the stars definitely have moved. Now we know roughly how far that is. We know the angle they move, so we can tell their velocity. Yes, the velocities are very much like what was being found with gas velocities. And uh, that was watched over several years. Um, the first person to see that motion actually was uh, Gensel and Eckert in Munich. But Gase and others uh, at uh, UCLA have done a lot of the measurements, too. And they agree now. Here's, um, here's Eckert and Gensel's work. They plotted the position of stars as a function of year. From 92, you see, to about 2000. You can see the, these are the positions. And clearly, they have moved an angle. And so from that, you can determine the velocities. And you get the velocities of stars. Here is a. a picture of the various stars and their relative motions. Well, uh, <clears throat> this, is this, this is the scale of velocity. That's 500 kilometers per second. Now, another thing that using the stars allowed was to get very close into the center. The center is about in here. And some of these stars are very close. So they were getting 500 kilometers per second. The gas that we saw was up to about 250 or 300 kilometers per second. This is still faster. And some of them faster than that, even. And here is a picture very close in um, uh, with the various directions and magnitudes of velocities as, uh, as found. Uh, recently, uh, the UCLA group thinks they have even seen some curvature in the motion, saying now they see them circling around. And this is a plot. This is Sagittarius A star. This is the plot of the positions. Now, there's some curvature there. You might doubt how certain that is, uh, that curvature. But they say, well, you can plot it in various ways. There's various sorts of ellipses that this might be forming. But here's the best one. They think it's going around an ellipse like this. Give them another five or 10 years, and they'll be around here. And sure enough, they'll really tell you exactly the orbits. And uh, now, furthermore, some of these are very close. This one's very close in. See, that seems to have some curvature. Uh, and so we can plot these ellipses. Uh, given, a, given another decade, we'll have a very detailed information about these orbits, exactly what mass is there, what the distances are, and we'll, we'll, we'll know much more. But already, we know enough to be pretty convincing. Now, <clears throat> uh, let's look at a batch of stars interacting with each other. And how should they behave? Well, they're very much like molecules. They bump into each other, bump into each other, and share energy. They should all have the same energy, just like molecules bumping into each other have the same temperature. They have the same kinetic energy. So when stars are just massed together in a, in a, in a galaxy, nothing else there. They're bumping into each other and sharing energy. They should all have the same velocity. If, on the other hand, you have a heavy mass in the center of the galaxy, then the stars not only bump into each other, they go around it. And as they go around, the velocity should increase like 1 over the square root of the distance as they get closer and closer. It should get faster and faster. Just like Mercury is closer to the sun than we are, it goes faster. Uh, some of you students might work these things out. You can see just exactly how they behave. Uh, but it gets faster and faster as you get closer. And sure enough, the velocities got faster and faster. The gas velocities and the stellar velocities got faster and faster. And so you could plot, then, the mass inside of a given radius as a function of radius. And this is uh, one, of the, one of the latest plots. And now, using all the data, the gas information gave us points up to about in here. But the stellar information gives us points really right on much, much closer. How close? Well, up to about 0.02 parsecs. Now, one parsec is three light years, so that's, uh, that's a 0.06 light years, getting awfully close. And inside of that, there has to be a mass still of about three times three million solar masses inside of one, six, one, uh, one sixteenth of a light year, even. Has to be a mass. And you see the mass is pretty constant. This plots the mass as a function of mass inside of a circle as a function of radius of the circle. And it's pretty constant. 
So clearly, there's a central mass inside of, uh, inside of a, a, a sixteenth of a light year. And uh, well, that's pretty concentrated for, for three million stars. And people say, well, yeah, yeah, that has to be a black hole. It has to be a black hole, a black hole of about three million solar masses. Um, now, that, um, that was satisfying in a way to, um, to come out with an answer. Everybody's pretty much agreement now. Yes, however, what about the problem of radiation? It radiates radio waves, a good, pretty intense radio waves, very, very little infrared. It's doubtful whether we've really seen any infrared radiation. We won't see visible radiation anyhow because it won't get out through the dust clouds. But we should see inf infrared radiation. How much should we see? We know how much material is falling in. Calculations see, see, say we should see at least a thousand times more than we're seeing. So theorists have been struggling with, well, how can we explain this? How can we explain this? How can we get away from it? Now, as a matter of fact, by the time this came out, by the time all of this got settled over well, a measuring period of about 25 or 30 years. More and more data kept coming in. But also other galaxies were being examined and velocities of materials around the other galaxies. And people were finding heavy black holes, they felt, in other galaxies, some of them as large as a billion solar masses. The things were going around very fast. Uh, now. Some of those were radiating very intensely, just what was expected. They were radiating intensely. But about 40% of them were not. Now, in the case of a distant galaxy, you can, you can cast that aside and say, well, we don't know how much material is very close in. We can't see. There may not be much material close in. Maybe nothing is falling in right now. OK, so those distant galaxies, even though a lot of them are not radiating the way you'd think, Maybe there's nothing falling in. What about our galaxy? Now, when we can calculate how much gas is falling in, we also know that a star ought to fall in every once in a while. When a star gets as close as the Earth is to the sun, it'll be sort of torn apart, torn apart and made in gas, and it'll rotate and fall on in. So a lot of stars would fall in. Every few thousand years, there ought to be a new, another star falling in. That ought to make a big burst of energy, enormous. But we know there's gas falling in all the time. And why not getting some energy? Uh, now, the Russians have used uh, the Granat uh, spacecraft, which measured x-rays. And the Russians have looked at the galactic center and near it and all around the galaxy to see if they could, could they find any x-rays due to this very energetic source or what's supposed to be a very energetic source. Well, you find some x-rays coming from the galactic center, not a large amount, but uh, again, roughly a thousand times too small. Uh, now, as they moved out in the galaxy, said, well, if we find x-rays out here, those might have come from the galaxy, the center of the galaxy, having a big explosion. The x-rays go out, and they hit some gas out here and get scattered towards us. So if you go a hundred light years away from the center and see is anything being scattered towards us, you can say, well, did something happen a hundred years ago in the galactic center? What a wonderful timing device. You can go 500 years out from the center and say, well, did anything happen 500 years ago? And so on. And they had enough sensitivity they felt to go out about a thousand years, nothing happened. Nothing happened that was big in the last thousand years there. Well, again, that, all this gets pretty serious of difficulty. And uh, let me summarize now by saying what, what we found and what we understand and what we don't understand. Well, you can see we understand a lot of things here. It's a wonderful laboratory, unusual things happening. We find a black hole. It's well, 2.9 million solar masses is sort of the best number, but that's plus or minus 10 percent. But about 3 million solar masses is a black hole, I think, Almost everybody is pretty convinced. We also find a peculiar uh, collection of stars there. 
A large number of stars are really somewhat like wolf rayet stars, we call them, the stars emitting hydrogen and helium and so on. They're hot stars, a rather unusual types. A lot of those stars, there are a lot of new stars there. Not very many red giants. Now, red giant is a, a bright reddish star, like Betelgeuse in Orion, a big red star in Orion. Red giants, very, very few of those there. Lots of new stars but a star is only up to a certain temperature. Uh, now one might, so there's an unusual formation of stars in that region. One might say, well, no wonder, after all, this is a large gravitational force there and unusual things, clouds being pulled together and that'll form new stars. And of course, it won't be like the stars we see in other parts of the galaxy. However, uh, we don't know just how, what is formed. And furthermore, if we go about uh, 100 light years away from the center, Here's one, another big batch of new stars, somewhat like the ones very close, and they're not all that close to the galactic center. That's this pistol nebula where this biggest star of all is. So there's something, something peculiar in the star formation that we haven't worked out yet. We don't understand very well why the stars of this particular type, a lot of new stars, essentially no old stars remaining there, uh, but most of the new stars are, let's say, not very, very high temperature. Um, now, the lack of luminosity from Sagittarius A star itself is the most serious discrepancy and, in a way, the most exciting. Of course, part of the fun of discovery is to learn something new. <laughs> if you've got a, a new tool, you can measure something more precisely, measure something new, you find something unexpected, well, that's great, because that leads us on to further thoughts and better understanding. And so this is just great that uh, here we know it's a black hole. We know there's material there that must be falling in, but it isn't radiating the way we thought. How to explain that? Well, the best explanation we have at present is the following, that there's a star, material falls towards it, and then circles around it and ionizes and falls in gradually, radiating all the time. Ah, well, suppose it just falls straight in doesn't circular, circulate around. There's no angular momentum. It falls right straight in. Well, it'll go in very quickly then and won't do very much. That helps some. However, we know where the gas is. We know what the velocity of the gas is. We know it's not all falling straight in. But maybe uh, right now, some most of it's falling straight in. That's still not enough. It'll still radiate too much. Well, uh, maybe as the fall, gas falls in, the gas collides with itself and sort of squirts out in this direction. It c comes together like this and squirts out, and that gets rid of the energy. Okay, well, if you, if you do that, you make a sort of polar, polar type emission like that, and say most of it's falling straight in. Use both of those, you can just about make it and say, well, okay, this just about explains things. It's not a very satisfactory explanation, obviously, because we've got to strain ourselves and do some rather peculiar things. Um, and, uh, and there we are. Now, where do we go from here? In the first place, clearly we're going to have more and more orbits, more complete orbits, and we'll get very detailed, very precise information about the distribution of mass. Uh, secondly, maybe there'll be an outburst there. Maybe there'll be a star falling in, and there'll suddenly, suddenly be an outburst of radiation. There ought to be an outburst of radiation. In fact, these models which attempt to explain say, well, there ought to be a very big variation about every 10 years or so in the material falling in. And we ought to see some fluctuation. So we keep watching it. Now, it's not only a question of making more detailed, more detailed, more precise measurements, looking at everything closer and closer, but also simply time will tell us a lot as we watch it and see what happens. Someday a star will fall in. Maybe there were stars falling in the past, letting out a big burst. People on Earth wouldn't have seen it because of the dust. But now with our instruments, it'll be obvious. Enormous burst of energy coming out in the radio and infrared and so on if a star falls in. That'll be real fun. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're looking forward to. Thank you.
comments? Yes, sir. And I was wondering what, what what happened to that. You said there was some kind of uh, intense radiation in the spectrum of aluminum 26. Any way of using that to say what happened in the past? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. yeah. Well, yes, that certainly gives us some hints uh, that there was a very, a very, very energetic explosion of some, time, some kind within the last million years or so. Where? In the center of the galaxy? And it's near the center of the galaxy. But it doesn't pinpoint things terribly well. So within a few million years, and within, a, within an area of, uh, somewhat bigger than the ellipse around it. And so maybe there were a lot of supernovae. We, but on the other hand, it might have been some stars falling into the galactic center, too. Possible. Uh, we'd like to see another event like that. But that's now gone far enough, and it's broad enough. We, we, we don't get a very precise interpretation. Yes, please. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, please use the microphone so I can hear you better. How does the phenomena of black hole affect the center of universe and expanding universe? Like there is a theory that universe is expanding and the rate I'm, of expanding. I'm sorry, would you say that again? Speak a little more slowly. Uh, like you, people say that universe is expanding at the speed of light. Like if you go towards the edge of the universe, the, un the dust, the cosmic dust is expanding at the speed of light. So how does the that function, expanding universe, relates to black holes? Oh, <laughs> well, they might. The universe as a whole may be a black hole, too. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> so is it not is related at all? Is that what you mean? Yes. But um, it's not the kind of black hole we see here where everything is very, very compact. There still could be, could be enough mass that nothing can get away, you might say. But uh, it's not like these black holes that are very, very compact, and you can get up closer to them. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, in this laboratory that is this black hole, can be seen weird effect in terms of, I don't know, conservation of energy and matter, weird behavior that we don't see in everyday physics? Did you say that again? I'm sorry. Okay. So can be uh, observed in the... Um, black hole, some, I don't know, unexpected phenomena in terms of conservation of energy and matter that we don't observe in, I don't know, everyday. Search in, in the black holes? Yeah. Unfortunately, we, we can't very well get inside of a black hole. Uh, <laughs> we can get inside of one if we found one nearby, but we wouldn't, wouldn't get out again, wouldn't be able to tell anybody what we saw, you see. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it, it's interesting that are even troubles. We don't understand black holes very well. One of the troubles is that if something falls in it, it loses all its history, so far as we know. Now, physics and science generally says, you know, uh, an object, from looking at the object now, in principle, you can tell its past history. You can tell where it came from and what happened and what developed it, you see. If you fall in the black hole, all that past information is gone. And uh, unfortunately, if we get in the black hole while we're gone. And uh, now, how to experiment with one, however? If we had a few small black holes around, it would be fun, as long as it didn't, <laughs> as long as it didn't come too close to us. Uh, I think, however, for the moment, we're stuck with the experimentation being observing these things and watching what's happened. A little different from a laboratory, where you can tweak things and play with them. In this case, you observe. And that's true of most of astronomy. You observe. You can't tweak, tweak the device. You have to look at it and watch it and then interpret it. And we can do a lot of that. And, I, uh, and there's going to be increasing information about black holes just from observations. But I'm afraid that's the only way I can foresee finding out more about them. Wish I had had one in the lab myself. <laughs> Please. Question. Uh, cosmological conjecture. Number one, how many uh, of the existing galaxies do you suppose have black holes at their center? And number two, uh, or anyone, suppose that the uh, black hole may have existed. What's its uh, history? Did it not originally exist? Does anyone have any ideas about this? Yes, well, um, from the very beginning, uh, and ideas about black holes, I think, think people felt that, well, the center of a galaxy would be a natural, a natural place for a black hole. And then they began to be discovered. 
we don't see large black holes in all galaxies, however. I don't remember what percent, but maybe 30% of them don't have any detected black hole. Uh, probably, well, 30% of them have uh, cases where we think we should detect something and we don't. Uh, now, that doesn't mean they don't have some small black hole, but they don't have these enormous big ones. But a good many galaxies do. And it's a very natural place for black holes to form, as I, as I mentioned. So it's not surprising. Uh, they range in size also from the order of a million to an order of the order of a billion uh, in, in, in the size of black holes. And surely it depends on the history of the galaxy, how many galaxies have bumped into each other and maybe uh, combined all of their, their closely, uh, their, their concentrated mass and that sort of thing. One row behind the camera. Yes, please. If, if the black hole emits Hogging radiation, it could be served to any source of information about what kind of uh, material is <clears throat> going inside of which amount of material is going inside? Uh, if I understand your question, you say, well, can the black hole tell us what kind of material is going inside? No. After it's gone inside, it doesn't tell us anything. While it's falling in, yes. While it's falling in, we may be able to say something about what's there because the electrons and protons and heavier elements will behave a little differently as they fall in. And if we can do good enough work uh, in radiation uh, measurement and spectroscopy and so on, we can tell something about what matter is falling in. But once it's inside of the black hole boundary, that is where nothing can get out, well, then uh, we have no hope. Yes, please. What's the closest you can get to? Ladder, What's the closest you can get to a black hole without getting pulled out? In in. Would you say it again? What's the closest you can get to a black hole without being pulled in? Well, that's a good question. How close can you get to a black hole? It depends on the size, of course. It depends on the size. But a black hole of this size, you can't get any as close to it as we are to the sun now. You know, we're a long distance from the sun, very long distance from the sun. Uh, but we can't even get that close to a black hole of this size. Now, if the black hole is very, very small, then we could get a lot closer. Because the black hole will pull things into it, but you have to get pretty close before you'd be snatched and can't get away. So it depends on the size. But most of them, uh, you wouldn't want to get anywhere near. <laughs> <laughs> stay, stay far out, as far away as we are from the sun. Yes, please. Uh, question. Uh, what caused the black hole to be at the center of the galaxy in the first place? I mean, what form of? No, what caused the black hole to be at the center of the galaxy? Why was the, what, what caused the black hole to be at the center of the galaxy? Oh, what caused the black hole to be at the center of the galaxy? Well, see, the center of the galaxy tends to pull things in. In fact, if you just had stars, stars would tend to pull on each other and pull each other closer and closer. Well, now, when they get very close, two stars maybe would merge. More stars would merge, more material fall. Make, at first, they'd make a very big star. But then enough material falls in, then maybe that would collapse into a black hole, but a small one, only a few masses, stellar masses, perhaps. And then other material, as it falls in towards the center, would accumulate there. So the center is a natural place for everything to be pulled in and gradually accumulate. And we'll all fall in there eventually. We'll all fall in, okay. but uh, you know, it'll be some, I don't know, 100 billion years maybe, or something like that before we fall in because we've got to bump into something to knock us a little closer, closer towards it, lose our angular momentum. Uh, but it's very natural that everything gravitates towards the center, mass accumulates there, and then if black holes can exist, that mass, mass is going to pull each other together more and more strongly and form a black hole. Okay, thank you. Right up here? Yes, please. Just as you reach the speed of sound, you get a concentration of particles that produces a sonic boom. When you get to a critical mass for the formation of a black hole, do you get a similar type of uh, concentrated wave front? Did you get that? He said just as in, in a sonic boom, a concentration of, of gas molecules. As you get, as a black hole forms, is there a critical mass? Critical mass of. As you approach a critical mass for the formation of a black hole, do you get similar kind of uh, concentration of particles 
in a wave front, like the sonic boom? Is there a concentration of particles before the black hole forms? Just as it forms. Oh, yes. Oh, sure. Uh, so far as we know, these are, these are normal particles before, before the black hole is formed. Uh, and they are attracted and they pull together and uh, form a black hole. Now, some, we may even have some stars which, in exploding, the stars explode, they normally they might form a neutron star, for example. But in principle, they might form a black hole. Star explodes, throwing some material out and condensing some other material. And there may be a moderate number of smallish black holes around various places. Uh, and maybe we'll see, be seeing some radiation from them. We have to decide what's a neutron star and what's a black hole and so on. But um, material is ordinary material before, before it falls in. And then from there on, we can't describe it anymore. Because we just have no contact with it. Now, uh, let me say that Hawking has done some interesting theory and say, well, things can escape from a black hole. And that's right. If it's a very, very small one, then you've got a very, very small chance of one part of a particle getting out. In principle, something can get out. But in, uh, in real practice, why nothing gets away from a black hole, something, certainly nothing this big, nothing with, gets away from a black hole this big. But there are quantum mechanical ways of things getting away, burrowing out from a very small black hole, just as there are quantum mechanical ways of something going through a barrier which it can't get over. A particle can go through a barrier instead of getting over it. But uh, that has no real effect on the things we're discussing. Please. I actually have two questions. Um, first was I was wondering, I, read, I, va I vaguely remember reading something that says it's possible for two black holes to kind of merge together. Is that true? Can they just kind of join together to form a larger black hole? Sure. And it actually does. They just have a more massive one, and the radius just increases. Yeah, two black, hole, two black holes can come together and form a more massive one. That's quite possible. Okay. And yeah. my other question was, how, how, what is different between, what's the difference between these mini black holes that you hear about and these other more standard black holes that form from supernova <laughs> explosions? Well, the many black holes are implosions. black holes we don't, we've never seen. And we can theorize about them, but we've never seen them, we've never measured them, and they'd be pretty dangerous if we had them floating around. Uh, so uh, one, one simply theorizes about them. The theory seems right, but whether they ever get formed, we don't know for sure. The big black holes are the ones we can see, and we can see them because they are big, and they're doing very big things out there, and that's why we see them. But undoubtedly, there's some smaller ones, but uh, I don't know how small. I think we'll take this to the last question, please. <clears throat> is, a, is a black hole the antithesis of the Big Bang? In other words, the black hole is sucking matter in. The Big Bang is, a, is spelling matter. So is one the antithesis of the other? In a certain way, yes. In fact, uh, someone asked about our own, our own uh, universe. Our own universe is expanding, and from the original Big Bang, so-called, it's expanding. Now, if there's enough mass in our universe, it'll expand for a while, and then stop, and then contract, and fall together. And some people have felt, oh, that's great. It'll just, you know, so our universe has always been here. It just contracts, and then explodes again, and so on. But the theory says if it contracts and falls together, it'll be a black hole and never come out of it again. So yes, the black hole is with the whole universe <laughs> contracting. <laughs> if it did that, it would be a black hole, and, and that's the end of it so far as we know. So in a certain sense, you can say, yes, they, they are the antipodes. Charlie, thank you very, very much.